welcome to On the Road to DevHops. I'm Trace Bannon, and I'm here with one of my best buddies, Brian Finster. And every so often, we belly up to the virtual bar, and we get together, and we kvetch, or we spar. Or today, we really want to share some information with you about how to build your career and how to be better at what you do. Brian, why don't you say a little bit more about that? Oh, well, first, uh, what are you drinking? Oh, well, you see, it is... It is dry July, which means I'm going alcohol free. This is, in fact, sparkling water. It is a black cherry seltzer. Uh, so time is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Drink time doubly so. And mm -hmm. so I'm having a bourbon and diet coke. Oh, I have envy, sorta, but I've I have made my decision that I'm attempting my dry July. We'll see how that goes. So, but you know, Brian, you and I spend a lot of time looking to build community. We love helping other people. And you and I agree that, dang, we learn a lot from people. We learn from the arguments. We learn from the good recipes, the great ideas that come across. Getting in conversations, being on the phone. There's so much to this that we wanted to talk with folks and give them some ideas and maybe give them some leading practices for how they can start to really engage. But let's pull it back. Let's pull it back. Brian, talk to me a little bit about the last year or two and how you've been just engaging and the things that you've been doing. Well, it's, it's been more than a year or two, but, you know, uh, first, let me just, before I, I get into how I got on that path, I've learned so much more over the few years that I've been engaging directly and trying to contribute to the community than I have the previous years just kind of consuming. But several years ago, so when, you know, I, I started the, uh, the DevOps Dojo at Walmart, we're working with teams to try to help them get to continuous delivery. And as part of that, I uh, got connected with Paul Hammond, uh, who created trunk-based development. Mm -hmm come right and had him come to Bentonville to give some workshops on TBD and behavior driven development and several other things and got to hang out with Paul which was super cool and one of the Paul gave me all sorts of really good advice that reset my thinking uh, MVP what's a real MVP mm -hmm. he showed me what a real MVP was which was so much less than what I thought it should be <laughs> Uh, and uh, that kind of reset my thinking. But the other thing he told me was that, hey, you know, Brian, it's not enough to do the thing. You need to be seen doing the thing. Now, at the time, that made a lot of sense to me from a plan B perspective. I'd been at that company for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. but the thing that I was working on meant that I had to go and challenge people. And some of those people were many pay grades above me. And so that's risky. You know, I had good air cover at the time, but I, you know, still that's risky, right? And so being seen outside your organization doing something was a good plan B at the time. It was like, you know, if I'm seen doing things that I'm, I have a better chance of like not showing up somewhere with no street cred whatsoever. What's interesting about that is that my story is the opposite in terms of getting involved in community. When I joined Deloitte Consulting in 2007, right, when many of our listeners were still in grade school, yeah. uh, one of the things that I was pulled into was an architectural community of practice, especially I was leading framework development back when we still had frameworks, when we called for, you know, when we were doing those types of things. And in looking to build a community, I did a lot of wrong things uh, in trying to pull people together and trying to push out information and not being as open to, you know, where does the information come from? It was kind of like an enterprise architect, kind of, we're going to bring all the information centrally and then you can consume it from here. And I learned a whole lot. I actually did a talk on this at a Saturn conference, I think it was about around somewhere around maybe 2016, 2017, 10 years into this journey. But the firm 
the firm was so wonderfully supportive. Uh, a, a good friend uh, and mentor by the name of David Sisk said, I, I need you speaking out in public. Another friend named Brian Bright said, I need you at conferences. I'm like, what are you talking about? Why do I need to be at conferences? I go to conferences. I learn from conferences. They're like, no, 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 no. We need you to present and we need you to be, you know, really iron sharpening iron. We need you to engage with others, build your credibility, but build your knowledge base and start to do that. So I was actually egged on by a corporation to do that. So, so let me, let me tell you that, you know, the, my previous employer was not pushing people to speak at conferences. Mm -hmm. You don't need to speak at conferences when you're a fortune one company, right? You just come and do your job and make money for the company and it's fine. But I went to DevOps Enterprise Summit in 2015 and there was uh, Target was speaking. Okay. And I'm like, we had two people at the conference and Target was on the stage. And I'm a very competitive person and I wasn't going to let that stand. Wait, right? so, wait, wait, wait. I got to back up there. Did you just say that you're competitive, Brian? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, poke, I know it's poke, a shock. poke. Poke, yeah, poke, I know poke. that's I know that surprises many people, but I'm I'm somewhat competitive. And uh, and Target was on the stage. Of course, I immediately made friends with the the guys, uh, you know, Ross Clanton and and his group who were speaking because I needed information. So I went and harangued them about the Target Dojo to learn more about that. But still, I couldn't let that stand. I'm like, we need to be on stage because we're doing so much cool stuff. And we're doing it at a scale, an order of magnitude larger than Target. So we, why, why should we not talk about it? So I pushed really hard and got us on stage talking about what we're doing with, you know, continuous delivery. And the, which was cool, right? We got on stage, but the thing that I didn't expect and the thing that the reason that I keep pushing to speak at conferences, especially in-person conferences, I don't like remote conferences as much because of this. In person, you get to hang out with the other speakers and learn from them. You get to hear the real stories instead of the polished stories that are on the stage. But I would say another thing is it's not just hanging out with the other speakers. There are plenty of folks who didn't apply to speak for whatever reason, and they're at varying levels of their career. I find that I get as much from the other speakers, from the other presenters, as I do from the random folk that walk up and want to engage and want to sit down and have a conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. But but when you're the, – the thing about the speakers is that you can go and corner them in like over lunch or in the green room and ask them about the real stories, the real challenges, the things that their PR department won't let them say on stage, right? You can get the, the, the you know, wow, that, that seemed like it went really well. Yeah, it kind of did, except for this and this and this. And then it all fell apart because of these other things over here. And, and so you get to learn all these lessons. And yeah, absolutely, you know, I learn a lot from people asking me questions so let me track this back though. So we are both at this point talking to our audience, talking to our listeners and saying, you know, conferences are a wise investment for a couple of reasons. Don't plan to go to a conference and go to all the tracks and try and learn your craft. You're not going there just to learn by listening. Mm -hmm. Go to engage, have an engagement plan, have a thought about the people that you want to listen to and then go and talk to. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's like the first thing is conferences can be, can be golden. They can be amazing. And submitting to speak can be intimidating. There are a lot of good resources out there, but I'd also offer to anybody if they want help, both you and I, we do this and we've been pretty darn successful, glad to help and mentor folks and get them across the line if they would like to submit, if they'd like to, or if they'd like to partner or whatever they would like to do yeah. to jumpstart uh, this. I'm, I'm happy to help anybody who's trying to make things better. And mm -hmm. this is the other thing, you know, specifically about conferences, and we can go on to other topics here later, but if you're going to a conference, 
go with the attitude that everybody who's on that stage is trying to help you. So track them down and ask them questions because they want the questions. They're there. They're not there just to talk. They're there. But the, the reason they're talking, unless they're trying to sell you something, the reason they're talking is because they want to help. That they've they found some good way of doing something, and that if it's useful to you, go get, go dig, go ask them the real stuff they can't say on stage or they can't fit within the frame of a talk. Well, and with the with most talks, most not all, being re reduced, right? The pandemic, the or should I say, I like to say the lockdowns have caused us to have a, a loss in focus. We used to actually have ninety minute sessions at times then. I was surprised when it got down to an hour, then 45 minutes. I haven't seen many more than 25 minutes lately. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, I had a different experience, though, because the, the very first time that I spoke external to my company, I just had to go for broke. And I went for the biggest thing I could, I could find, which was DevOps Enterprise Summit, because I was terrified of public speaking. And so if you're going to if you face your fears... And those talks were 30 minutes. Right. But my point now is that the oftentimes, at least when I started, it was rare that anything was less than 45 minutes. You know, a oh, decade, yeah. 15 years ago, it was, la you know, anything that was less than 45 minutes was like, oh, it must be advertising something or it must be like a, a quick vendor show where they're doing their razzmatazz. And I've, I've had two 50 minute talks. Uh, everything else has been 30 minutes or less. Those two 50 minute talks were, those. that's so liberating because you have so much time to just expound. <laughs> so you're saying five zero, not 15. Yeah, I've had two. Not I've, a lightning talk. No, well, no, it talks five minutes. But you get really good at trying to get the right information out when you're limited to 30 minutes. And almost oh, yeah. every talk I've ever given has been 30 minutes or less. I would say so. I would, I would say that that's true. And I actually believe that we need to do that internally in our corporations when we're working with sponsors or clients. I desperately shy away when they say, can you come and do, can you talk to us for an hour? I'm like, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. But what do we want to learn? What do we want to exchange? Glad to seed that with this kickstart. Let's start with this first 20 minutes. And then if we, we want to have a conversation after that, kind of the similar mentality. I don't want to be pontificating at people with their not, when they're not interacting. I want to bring real value and help them be better at what they do. No, yeah. And I, I much prefer having a conversation than a presentation anytime. But circling back to, you know, why right i mean you learn so much more so i remember there was a, a vp in my previous company who kept saying we want to be a learning organization and and i pushed back on that i said we don't want to be a learning organization we want to be a teaching organization because to teach something you have to actually learn it you have to learn it well enough to communicate it to somebody else and if every and if you're challenging everybody to push out information inside the company and teach something, then they have to learn something to do that. If you're a learning organization, all you're doing is consuming things that you may or may not have learned. I'm going to say yes and to that, my friend. I'm going to say yes and because I've seen plenty of groups. I could attest to some that I will not name right now because it would be very inappropriate for me to do this and say... They're teaching organizations and there is truth to the old saying that if you can't do teach. No, 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 and no. So not, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. I'm just saying that I want to, I want to make sure that when we talk about this, that we're talking about teaching with expertise, teaching with experience, bringing those things forward. Not that you've gone out and Googled and chat GPT or studied something really quickly and turned around and have been able to then cobble something together to tell the next person. When we're talking about teaching, we're talking about being a, a, a teaching and learning, a continuous, right, organization where yeah, people I, are I, learning and then turning around and, and teaching. I mean, I've worked with a lot of smart people and they can detect bullshit pretty easily if, if, if you're just regurgitating something you read on Google once. Yeah, you can tell though, you can tell. But I, I've been in situations where I've been there as an expert and someone else is there as an expert. And we're talking to a whole bunch of client type people. 
and I'm listening to the other person and I'm just like, whoa. No, 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 no. This is, but this is, this is the thing I want to clarify. I'm okay. not talking about a teaching organization where you're out there talking to people outside your organization. Okay. I'm talking about within the organization, we should be teaching each other. Okay. I can get behind because that. There's a different dynamic, right? Because you don't automatically have expertise inside your organization. In fact, it doesn't matter how good you are in your organization. Anybody outside your organization is instantly smarter than you are because they don't work for your organization, right? Actually, no, this is serious, right? I went to Verizon one time and we were comparing notes. Mm -hmm on dojos and I propose that we should open source consulting and just expert as a service. It's like, I need somebody from Verizon to come to my company at the time to go and give a talk and I'll go give a talk to Verizon. We'll just trade. Mm -hmm. Just tell me what you want me to say and I'll say it. And we'll, you do the same for me. Did we'll that do... work? Oh yeah, that works. It absolutely works. And it, it's, you know, a lot cheaper than bringing in like a, you know, like Accenture or somebody to do the same thing where you just whisper in the consultant's ear and then they just say whatever you, you want them to say. Well, and I don't, I don't think that all consultancies are bad having been part of a couple of different That's ones. what I'm saying. That's no, no, I'm no, no, no. I'm, I'm not accusing you of that. I'm, I'm, quali I'm qualifying what I'm about to say. Okay. Getting back, back to being a teaching organization. Yeah. It is in order to teach, we need to learn. And so all I'm saying is that there's a yin and a yang to this, right? There are, are both sides of it. And you are going to be continuously learning and then turning around and continuously teaching what you've just learned, what you've experienced, what you have been educated on. That's all I'm trying to balance that. That's all. And, you know, the, the reason I had that opinion was because I started teaching behavior-driven development as the very first thing I was giving internal presentations on. Mm -hmm. Because my team found it useful. And in the process of teaching BDD, I had people bringing up questions that we on my team we weren't coming up with and had to keep hardening that approach, right? And getting better at behavior driven development while because people are asking me those questions because I didn't immediately have street cred because I was internal to the company, right? But having that, you know people willing to challenge you because they're not paying you thousands of dollars an hour. To... <laughs> I think, you know, you and I, I think have a mutual friend through the value stream management consortium, Sejal Amin. And we were, we were chatting and she was telling me about being at the table and essentially her organization looking at the person beside her and saying, tell us, tell us about what's going on in industry. And she had given exactly the same advice you know, like a week or two prior. And they essentially dismissed her. And yet they listened to this new voice coming in. And what the only difference between the two messages was that, well, you're not part of us. So obviously, you know more, you're better, you're smarter, you're different, you're a breath of fresh air. That's an interesting phenomenon. And, and quite frankly, a frustrating phenomenon at times. <laughs> Because if you know what you know what you know, and you've been engaging with industry, yeah. I do not sit inside my firm. I don't sit inside MITRE, who's my day job. I don't sit inside there alone and just keep my head down and squirrel away and do good things. I'm constantly out there having those conversations with industry. They can bring in industry, but chances are I've already done the research. I've already experienced it. And so I would... It would, it would frustrate me if that same thing happened where they said, you know, we can't listen to you, Bannon, but your buddy Finster, your buddy Finster. Now we got to. There is a plus side to that. Mm -hmm. That if you are wanting to be out there and helping people, and I can't tell you enough, I just can't stress enough, right? That being out there and helping people, let's, let, we're going to talk about the impact of that to your career in a minute, mm -hmm. but doing it internal to your organization where people are not wowed by your presence, right, forces you to come up with really good reasons for why, because you will be challenged and you should welcome that because code review is love and external people are not going to review you as hard, as, as, as intent, intensely as your peers inside your organization, mm -hmm. right? Stay humble. <laughs> you know? 
I think that's a, a big part of it is, is stay humble, but also be sincere about why you're doing this. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to go out on the edge and say, there are some folks who they want to keep their head down and they want to work and they are happy to, to just be in that, I don't even, with their blinders on getting stuff done and they don't want to interact in quite the same way. They don't want necessarily to teach. So I will say that it will vary from person to person and there are, there's a certain amount of comfort to it. I do think that people need to get over that at times and challenge themselves, but- It depends on your career goals. Exactly, exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. if your career goals are to basically stay where you're at and just do that work, then do that. You know, from my point of view, I've, I have been laid off before and I have imposter syndrome and those two things together mean- You do I'm, not have imposter syndrome. Okay. And those two things together mean that, that I'm, I don't want to be in a position where I have to go and compete with a whole bunch of other people who are obviously more qualified than I am so I want to, I want to, for a job, right? I want to be, I want to be in a position where I'm the obvious choice, which means that I need to be learning all the time. And I'm the only, and the best way to learn is to show other people how to do the things that I just figured out. And to be pushing out information all the time and getting that information challenged and, and improving it, right? Nothing makes me feel so validated as when I push out some piece of content, some piece of thought, and somebody challenges me and I'm crystal in what I am. I'm thinking about it and I'm crystal and I'm able to come back and engage. And we're not talking about like a, a dogmatic and nastiness. We're talking about truly engaging in a public way and having those conversations yeah. and helping people to evolve and maybe sometimes even changing my mind. That is the most validated for me, for Bannon, I could, because I love to teach and I love to talk and I love to engage with humans. That is very cathartic to me. But I want to come back to something that you said, and I want to play with this for just a minute because I think it's really important. And it's, it's one of those moments where we can be authentic with our listeners. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the fierce and intimidating Brian Finster can sometimes have imposter syndrome. Well, I mean, sometimes. Okay. So there's, there's things that I know that I know, and I know mm -hmm. that I know them because I've done them. Mm-hmm. I've seen other people done do them. I have I have challenged my assumptions on them. There, there's like I have experimental experimental evidence that this is objectively true, mm -hmm. and those are things where I will just say this is objectively true for these reasons. Until you can prove me wrong, but the when I take a hard stance on something, it's because it's been tested thoroughly. Okay, right. There's other things that I know I don't know, and I won't do that. I, I will just say I don't know. But right? but I would. But, but how does that align? Hold on. How does that align to imposter syndrome? Because what you've just told me is there are things that you know and things that you don't know, and you understand the the difference between them. That's like that's like meta understanding about yeah, yourself. Yeah. That's a positive. There's a huge gap in the middle of things where I am questioning myself all the time. Ah. Right. <laughs> so those are the extremes. Okay. All right. <laughs> right. But there's stuff in the middle where I'm questioning myself all the time. Now I will say that since you know, over the past few years where I've been out there pushing ideas out, and having those ideas challenged and having to defend those ideas as if I was standing in front of a PhD review mm -hmm. board. Right. Right. In the military, they call that a murder board. The, yeah, the things in the middle are getting smaller and the things on the edges are getting bigger. Right. And I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I used to have absolute crushing imposter syndrome. And there's things that will still trigger that. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I don't want to go down that path. But so it's, I love that you are open to being open. Because 
uh, as I've talked to, you know, Robin Yeeman, oh my gosh, she's finished out her PhD. Uh, I, I literally am a fangirl for, for Robin Yeeman. And she will say that she has imposter syndrome, that she has pretender syndrome at times. And that I'm beginning to think that we are simply using a word. We finally figured out a word that allows us to capture a phenomenon that we felt for a long time. I don't know that we've suddenly all be all started having imposter syndrome. I just feel that we've finally got a term that we can identify with. You know, are people going to realize that I don't know this body? Do I not know this? Well, what do I know? And yeah, I agree so I, with you. I, I think it's 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 that uh, that emotional feeling that I'm just not good enough, right? Mm -hmm. And but here's the here's the thing that started to help me, right? Because number one, I have felt that for years, most of my career. And a lot of it had to do with the fact I'm a college dropout. I always felt, you know, second class because of that. I, you know, there's all these different things that made me feel less than. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was at a, a small conference. It's like 60 people. It was an invitation only conference. One of the speakers was Kent Beck. And because it's so small, the speaker's dinner is lunch, right? And so you're sitting there, and and it's just a group of people. And so I had lunch with Kent Beck, and and he'd just given a talk about his crushing imposter syndrome. I'm like, holy crap, Kent Beck suffers from the same thought and worse mm -hmm. than me, right? And him being open about it and then having at lunch talking about the ways he compensates for it was really helpful to me because then I, you know, when I'm feeling, you know, like overwhelmed by that, I can just remember, yeah, but so is Kent Beck. And then I just push through it. Well, I'm hopeful, my friend, my dear friend, that some of our listeners will be pushing through their day and they will say, oh, you know, this is really hard for me to deal with. I can't believe this, but I'm pushing through. Brian pushed through or Tracy pushed through. I think that's an important part because I'm I'm with you. There are there are days. My husband actually said to me, <laughs> came we were in, doing an interview with from my podcast, real technologist. He came running up the stairs and he stood in the door and he's like, "Do you hear that? Like what? What?" The guest had talked about the fact that they had imposter syndrome, and I'm like, "Yeah, can you believe that?" And he's like, "Does it remind you of anybody?" I'm like, "No, no, I don't." And he's like poking me in the stomach, like. Oh, but, wait a minute. But see, this is another reason why pushing out what you think you know and having it challenged mm -hmm. is so important is because the flip side of that is when you push out things that you, that you believe to be true mm -hmm. and someone you respect responds back in a positive way, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, when that happens... It's awesome. That happens to me occasionally that somebody that I, I've respected for a long time responds back with something like, hey, this is, you know, this is good stuff. You should listen to what he had to say. Like, Holy or, or we have to make sure that everybody knows. Do your homework and put yourself out there. And don't be surprised if somebody disagrees because that's okay. You actually want, oh. <laughs> you, no, no, you want to have disagreements. You don't want everybody just going like, 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 like what you said. Great. Thanks. Woohoo. I want no, people no. to challenge. I want to have the dialogue and yeah. nothing makes me feel quite as accomplished in these conversations as when it's gone on and gone on and gone on. And somebody messages me privately and says, Thanks for getting that conversation started. You're like, yes, because they're yeah, learning you know, the, from uh, it and they're engaging with it. The, the, the thing you have to remember is that you need to, you need to look at what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And number one, see if it's reasonable, mm -hmm. if it's a reasonable criticism, because I get lots of criticism, like a lot, right? And some of it is just like... You know, I'm I'm sorry you're not smart enough to put together a reasonable argument that all you're going to do is just try to bash me and use, you know, it's like steady your logical fallacies. Go look at how many logical fallacies they're using while they're trying to tell you you're wrong. But if you're not using a logical fallacy and you actually have a reasonable argument against me, 
I should have a response for that. If I don't, then I'm going to go back and go, I need to look into this further and see if what I believe is actually true mm -hmm. or if there's, you know, how do I respond to that particular argument? Because it could be that I'm going to make myself better by, by going, yeah, that, that's actually valid. I need to, I need to adjust, or I have an answer for them that helps other people. But we've actually just transitioned during this conversation from talking about going to conferences and putting yourself out there. Start with the small conferences and don't go directly for reInvent and think you're going to get on the stage. Start oh, no, with no, your no, no, local, no. start with your regional, start it. with your meetups. No, 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 no. I just go straight to the top because everything else is easy. Oh, okay. Well, so I would say that it does become, it is, you're statistically, you're less likely for that acceptance when you're going. So yes, submit wherever you want to. However, <laughs> yeah, I often help newer in career individuals cutting their teeth on the local ones, on the more regional ones, on the slightly smaller. So you have a couple of hundred instead of a couple of tens of thousands because they are more likely to get that acceptance and then I can help them. Um, and, so, so, and, and this is important. This is important. I get rejected from conferences. Mm -hmm. I submit talks and I get rejected. Okay. And I'm very experienced at speaking. Uh, the, st the stuff that I talk about is always focused on helping people. It's always very well received. Mm -hmm. And I get rejected. Don't fear rejection. It's like, oh, well, okay, I don't have to prepare that talk. Well, I got rejected recently from the Diana Project. Is it Diana Project? Diana Project. And I actually had submitted. I was really excited about three different topics in three different areas. And I got a nice little, you know, this is great, but, you know, it's really hard. We have so many qualified oh, speeches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I just wrote back. I'm like, I'd really be interested in actual, because they offered actual feedback. I'd love to get some actual feedback. And we engaged. And it was, it was eye-opening because I understood their, I understood for their community how, what their evaluation process is, what they're looking for. And you don't always get it right. Different communities have sometimes a little slightly different spin on what they're looking for. So yeah, don't be afraid. I would say that you can, you can shoot for the, do the moonshot. You can do the Brian and go for uh, does uh, enterprise. And you can also start regionally, start locally. It's up to you, but just do it. Uh, do yeah. some things internally as well, but get out there on the, on the conference type thing. Even one day conferences are awesome. They are totally worth it. I will travel a fair distance for a one day conference, but we've started to transition to some of the online stuff that we do that is much more dynamic. It's a faster pace, right? It's a, it's I, a, I, there's no, a consistency and a constancy to it. As a speaker and as an attendee, I don't like the online stuff as much as I, I mean, I, I will say that number one, during the pandemic, I met a lot of new friends internationally mm -hmm. because I was going to a conference that was uh, was focused on trying to build community and not just hear watch talks. Yeah. But you don't have as much opportunity to go and just talk to people. You don't have accidental conversations with people. Well, the majority of online conferences now are pre-recorded yeah, uh, and, and I, there's I, and there's a um, simulation that they ask you to show up to answer q a afterwards so i'm not a big fan i i personally it's rare that i will attend a virtual thing unless i know that the people are going to be live and talking live I, I i just don't bother with it because i'll get the recording afterwards i i will and i'll put it at 1.5 and i will speed through their stuff and get the two nuggets that i need where I was going with the online piece is looking at our different social mechanisms, all the different tools there are for us, whether yeah. it is LinkedIn, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Slack. Oh my goodness, the number of different amazing Slack channels. Those are all excellent ways to start to engage. Put yourself out there, put some thoughts out there, ask a real question and be ready for people to answer. And yeah. don't be afraid of the answers. I mean, that is different than being, and uh, that's different than a conference. But, you know, if you balance those things out, that's another aspect of community that can be really valuable. 
there, there's something else I'd like to stress, though, is read the room. You know, there's some communities that are better than others. That I've been, I'll say that universally, the DevOps community is incredibly, uh, well, it, it's just the culture of actual DevOps is a generative culture. People mm -hmm. are trying to help each other because it's not, DevOps is not, you know, about, like doing operations with code. That's that's not what DevOps is. And it, you know, DevOps is trying to improve everything about how we deliver things. And if you go back to the original stuff, it's culture is the number one thing, right? And so the DevOps community is very giving. A lot of people like I, I'm trying to pay it forward mm -hmm. because we've had a lot of people help us in the community. There's other communities where I've tried to engage and there's like some big dog in the community who wants to be seen as the big dog. And even though they know less than I do, they will try to shit all over everything I have to say because I'll come in with an opinion that doesn't match their opinion and they want people to listen to them, right? And completely toxic. And so I just won't engage in that community. But people need to be, this is where sampling communities is important. I I am involved in a number. Involved is a is a, a gosh, that's a heavier word than I even intend. There are many where I go in and observe, and I I join up and I try to get in inside and to your point, kind of observe a little bit and see if it's is it dynamic? Are people engaged? You know, is it is it a one way push? Is it bi directional? What's going on there? Folks need to be comfortable in saying, you know what this community is not right for me and that's okay it's okay because it's no different than high school when we used to have club day i don't know if you had this in your high school but we had clubs day and all the different clubs would have their tables set up and you went from table to table to try yeah, and figure I was, out I was, I was never a joiner in high school so yeah. I never, all right but, you, but they well, it used to be those, mandatory yeah you had to walk around and see it but so you go talk to the chess club and you go talk to the, the drama club and the tennis club and the foreign language club and the, you know, all the, the optimist club and the, you talk to all of them. And some of them felt really, 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 really comfortable. And some of them didn't feel so comfortable and that's okay. So it's no different now. People need to be a part of a community where they feel welcome, where they feel that they can contribute where they want to be a part of it. And it is a thousand percent okay to say that one over there, it's either, it's not for me, it's not dynamic, it's it's not a good fit for me, it's toxic, it's whatever. And you can actually quit the group, like literally go ahead and quit the workspace. It's okay, it's yeah. okay. Yeah, fine, it, it, you have to be comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. you, have to be able, you have to be able to be able to say things mm -hmm and not live in fear, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of Slack orgs I'm on. Too many, honestly, but there's a lot of Slack <laughs> orgs where, you know, I, I know that I can just go out there and talk and be treated like a peer, that no one's gonna go and just bash me, mm -hmm. that I can say things and get honest feedback. You know, and, and which is, again, like I said before, code review is love and, and having a, a, you know, people where it's just like the, the baseline is we respect you as a human, right? Most social media is not that, right? But, <laughs> you know, you need to have places where you like respect, you know, where there's you know, community where you're respected as a human to, to have a safe exchange of ideas. Do you remember how we actually met? I don't know if you will. A friend of ours set us up on a, a, a on, on a, uh, what, it's not a date. What would you call it? I don't know. It was an, it was an intro, but it was through, it was through Slack and it was actually through the Dojo Consortium. Yeah. And I was like, you guys need to meet each other. Like, well, hello well hello and it they were right i will uh, you know creds creds to creds to our mutual friend they were right and yeah. we've been hanging out for a couple of years now and so people also need to know that listen to me banging on my banging on my mic people need to know 
that you'll find relationships, really healthy, empowering relationships in a lot of different places when it comes to in being involved in this. I know I can pick up the phone and call you and say, what the hell should I do about this? Mm -hmm. And you will, you will shoot straight with me. I want for others to feel like they have that too. Brian, I need some help. I'm defining this reference architecture about digital platforms. And you'll be like, yeah, so wait the, a minute. So this, you... is, this is also super important because, be, because of the connections that I've made mm -hmm. with either speaking at conferences or just being engaged in the broader DevOps community, I have my own private boardroom. Right. I have, and, and I'm part of other people's boardrooms, mm -hmm. right. Where I've had either, I have called people for their advice on things, or I've had people call me on, on my advice. I've had people call me, you know, about, Hey, I'm thinking about moving from this area into a platform as a, as a, in, you know, a management position, you know, and I want to do this. What do you think? Well, let's, let's. Let's define that real quick, Brian, that board, when we're talking about boardrooms, when you're talking about that, you're specifically saying your own personal advisory committee, your own board of directors, you convene, doesn't need to be all of them at once, but you've got that posse of people that you know that ha you have trust relationships with who will sponsor you, who will look out for you, who will shoot straight, uh, you know, will poke holes in things if you're not doing something the right way. That's what you're when talking was, about. You know, I was when I was thinking about leaving a job I'd been at for 19 years, I called a, a bunch of people I deeply respected who three years before I would have been terrified to talk to, but I met them, right? And asked their opinion. And, you know, looked at what their feedback was and made a decision based off of that, right? And having the connection of people that are outside your, you know, your immediate circle that, you know, the, the industry advisors, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people that you can lean on to say, well, hey, what do you think about this? You know, it could be technical, it could be career, it could be whatever, but having someone, you know, people that you trust that are, you know, that I'm fanboys of. I mean, the, the fact that I'm a fanboy of all several people who I can just call and ask advice is because of the connections that I've tried to foster to help me be better at what I do. Yeah, it has, it's been so amazing to be able in the, in the DevOps communities. And I would say also, I've, I've spending a lot of time for, for all of <laughs> more than a decade in the architectural community, it's both the same way that I can pick up the phone. I can say, ping somebody on, on Slack. I can ping them on LinkedIn. We'll hop on a call and it's nearly immediate. If I mean, if it's something that I, I really need, people make time and you and I both ha are doing the same thing, kind of paying it forward or paying it back. I don't know which, how we say that, but so many people have invested time in us. We're turning around and looking to invest time in others because life is short. There's a lot of for us to do, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I think it's really it's it goes back to it's like the open source thing, right? You you can't just be a leech. Wait Give, a minute. You mean I can't yeah. just consume it without ever putting back in? I just, I'm just going to have something. I mean, this is the thing is that there are things that I know a lot more of than other people do, mm -hmm. but there's, there's people that I know more about a topic than they do, but they know more about something else that, than I do that I need. We all have like silo, uh, uh, like areas of information that we're really good at and other things, a lot more things or weak on. And you're, you're not going to get really good by just focusing on the things you're good on. Right. Yep. Right. You yep. need to go and build and, and have people that you can bounce ideas off of and learn from each other. Right. And you can't be afraid to talk to people because I mean, I've literally taught some of my heroes things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, 
it is such a, a shot in the arm in a good way when that happens. Well, it's just because on this, on one on particular this thing. topic, I knew more than they did. And so now we're, sh- now we're peers, now we're equals, now we're sharing. So I know we're have to get over the fear and spread your network and get to know people, understand everybody's human and, and try to learn as much as you can. If your goal is to improve your career, then you, you can't do it just by I'm really good at Java. Nobody cares. So if we're going to summarize our, our long and winding conversation for the evening, yeah. and I am so jealous of you having <laughs> more than my dry July. <laughs> be a You're part of life though, Tracy. So that's be a, be a part of, be a part of a community, pick a community that you feel comfortable with that will help you and make sure that you're a contributor. Don't be a consumer only, be a producer, be a producer and reach out to people, be open to exposing yourself to having a conversation and knowing that people are going to push back and give ideas because it's that thought diversity at the table. That's going to make a difference. That's how we learn. Is there anything else, Brian, that you would leave people with that you really want them to walk away from our conversation today? Just, you know, I, I think the litany against fear. If in, if anybody has a, a, a not read Dune, they should probably read Dune. But in Dune, you have the litany against fear. And I'm not going to quote it precisely, but it's, you know, I shall not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that, you know, leads to obliteration. You know, it's this whole thing about overcoming. Just, just mm-hmm. don't fear. Yeah. What was that? Fear uh, doesn't help anything when it comes to trying to get, uh, trying to improve ideas. Fear is what you use to avoid getting eaten by a tiger. <laughs> well, right? and but, the old adage that most of the things that we are fearful of and worry about never come to fruition, and we should not have worried about them in the first place. That's all. That's all exceptionally, exceptionally true. And, and one, one other thing, look, yes, sir. Just don't fear being wrong. All right. I, I am, this is something I stress to people all the time is I am not emotionally attached to what I'm saying being correct. I'm emotionally attached to what I'm saying being eventually correct. That is a mindset that many people don't have. And sometimes people take a response to them, a correction or an alternative point of view as though it's indicting your character. And sometimes there's some gender that goes with this too. We've talked about you know, how young women start to interpret that kind of feedback as though it's a, a, they're a character indictment as opposed to an indictment of the idea. Mm. Be ready to be challenged and accept it. Actually celebrate being challenged because you come out of it better both sides all sides it's, come it's out hard. better it's hard this is, you know when i say things like code review is love that's also to remind me mm-hmm. that code review is love <laughs> right? is there a it's, little bit of self-talk there brian is that what you're saying a little bit of self-talk it, well, it is because you know it it's impactful when someone challenges what you have to say or challenges what you do or it makes you think that your work's not good enough right but Look at it, it again if it's reasonable. Make it so that you're better. Mm-hmm. And if you think it's not reasonable, have a conversation. It's hard. People sh- shy away from this, or they feel disgruntled over it. They feel angry. If you feel something is unreasonable, I'm going to walk up to you. Maybe it's because I have the courage to now that I didn't before, and say, "I don't get this. I disagree with you. Let's have a conversation." And you could be, as the reviewer, you could be wrong. And we may we may come to a different outcome or I may learn something about your point of view. Mm-hmm. It's all about the dialogue. It's all about the dialogue. So, yeah. all right, Brian Finster, it has been a fantastic evening with you. I had a craptastic day and I almost decided, I, I was this close. I told my, I told, I told senior, my husband, I said, like, I don't feel like talking to anybody. He goes, You always like to talk to Brian. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Honest to goodness, I am so glad that I did not cop out on our conversation tonight, Brian. Thank you so much. (laughs) I I had a pretty good day because I spent the whole day coding. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's, I count that as a a win. 
So. My day was crappy until three o'clock when I put on my out of office message that said I'm working on a, wor a work product. And I just went over and I was heads down. I was just designing and it made me happy, 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 happy. And that was the lead up to you. So had I not had that two hours, we wouldn't have been talking unless I had some really hardcore yum yums in my glass. So, and to all of our listeners, thank you so much for always spending a really fun amount of time with us. We love to get your feedback, whether it is through email, whether it's through LinkedIn, hit us up directly through our email, anything you want to do, just let us know. And we'd love to connect, love to help. And we always want your inputs back at us. How can we improve? Tell us. We'd love to hear from you. And and do the the bell thingy, you know, like and oh, subscribe. Like and subscribe. Because, yeah, because click, that. Click, that ding, helps. ding, click, click. If, ding, if you ding. found it useful, uh, nobody else will find it useful unless you do that. That's true. That's very true. All because right. Because algorithms. Oh, yeah. That's, an, that's a topic for another conversation. The <laughs> algorithms. They're a change in. Oh, yeah. man, I want to rant about this. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye.